For everyone with an interest in NASH, or more broadly, fatty liver disease, Surf's Up, Season 2, Episode 44 of Surfing the NASH Tsunami starts now. This week on Surfing the Nash Tsunami. The idea that patients aren't needing information to make decisions today about what they do, where they go, how they do it, is something I need us all to, to get over. And that's the urgency with which we're hoping this evidence is generated. It's not only about getting a vaccine, it's about ensuring that the vaccine did what it was supposed to do. Now, we've known that, but here's a meta-analysis that actually put the risk at 80% increased threshold over a non-fatty liver patient. So I think your point is one that we need to drive home. And that is, it's not only about getting a vaccine, it's about ensuring that the vaccine did what it was supposed to do. Next up on my hit list is making sure that people are aware of monoclonal antibodies, but not using them as a get out of jail free card. The next thing that I'm going to be challenging, just FYI, for anybody who wants to know what's next up on my hit list, that's, that's next on my on my hit list. Yeah, so I saw a Twitter feed from County Durham in the UK mm-hmm. saying, hey, we've got to get our numbers up. They're too low. The numbers were 75.3% back, and that was too low. In the States, that's heroic. So I sent you guys this. There's a Twitter feed I saw today from someone in County Durham in the UK mm-hmm. saying, hey, we've got to get our numbers up. They're too low. The numbers that they were talking about, according to the government UK, were 75.3% back, and that was too low. In the States, right, that's heroic. To the best of my knowledge, we're not seeing massive breakthrough. And there's a big debate here at the moment as to whether we go ahead with booster program. We should be waiting to see whether there is a need. I certainly have more conversations with the vaccine centre when I do some of that. I'm not an immunologist. I'm not currently working in an acute setting. But to the best of my knowledge, we're not seeing massive breakthrough. And there's a big debate here at the moment that you may or may not be aware of as to whether we go ahead with booster programme, whether or not we should be waiting to see whether there is a group that need the booster programme. A global community of fatty liver disease stakeholders comes together to explore the most important challenges in diagnosing, treating, and developing medications for patients with fatty liver diseases. Join hepatology researcher and key opinion leader Dr. Stephen Harrison, liver wellness advocate Louise Campbell, pricing and forecasting guru Roger Green, and this week's guest, Global Liver Institute President and CEO Donna Cryer, as they discuss the ways the Delta variant of COVID-19 can impact the fatty liver disease community, this week on Surfing the Nash Tsunami. This is the second of my two weeks recording from the Jersey Shore. I'm full into shore mode, which you would see if you were looking at what I'm wearing, even if this topic brings out the urgent and high strung in me. But we'll try to stay away from them um, as we go through the topic. It's a great week, Surfing Nash. Regular listeners know my favorite weeks are the ones where we get together what I call the Surfing Nash Greatest Hits Band. Stephen, Louise, and then Donna Cryer comes back and joins us. We call it getting the band together. And this week, the band is together. Donna, welcome back. How's the summer treating you? And what's the exciting news from GLI this week? Hi. It's always... uh... A pleasure to be part of this great conversation. GLI is rocking and rolling. We are in full and deep retreat and reassessment of every corner of the organization so that come fall, we can explode with new things. It's hard for me not to divulge them all right here in this platform because I love to do that. I I am really excited about how the organization has grown and the new members of the team in, in almost every area and the talents and skills and relationships that they're bringing into the organization. As a founder, it's a really profound moment when the organization is really so much more than me. It really is about the collective talents of the organization. And so to have this time in depth with fewer external events and really have designed an entire 30-day process where we are pulling together our best ideas and putting them on writing and articulating them and refreshing and revamping things to relaunch in the fall, it's, it's just really exciting. I'm going to need a little trailer, you know, some kind of teaser. Well, let's see. GLI Live will be having a whole new look, fresh with the intro, outro, new look, new guests, new themes. I even get theme music, I've been told. So that's it. I could see you like Dora the Explorer in like hiking (laughs) boots and a little safari hat with your 
your hand over your eyebrows looking beyond the biopsy. (laughs) I will submit that creative brief to the team. But speaking of beyond the biopsy, we are excited to be launching events in in France and for Francophone Africa to extend that program. That is one of the biggest, and there are some other things that are going to be coming out for that program in particular. We thank EASL for their work in non-invasive diagnostics guidelines updates, but a big, big leap forward in the in the beyond the biopsy is is part of the relaunch. So excellent. And stay tuned as a teaser to the AASLD postgrad course lecture where I will be be talking a little bit about some of that opportunity as well. Just one of the things we were asked to do at the AASLD postgrad course this year was not speak to the knowledge that already is had, but be provocative in our thought about what is to come. I like it. Donna, part of that is Stephen campaigning that when you do your Dora the Explorer thing for Beyond the Biopsy, he would like to be next to you wearing a uh, Alps hat. Is he and, the monkey? No, 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 no. He's going to be wearing, you know, he's going a different direction. He's not going to be the monkey. He's going to, I'll be the monkey. He's <laughs> Be wearing leader hose. I'm the rock from Jumanji. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I, was, I was, I was, I was going to mix in a different direction. I was going to have you in Lederhosen and Yodel. Okay. My, my niece is coming later in this week for Aunt Donna camp, and so she will explain to me what all these things are, I'm sure, so that I can execute it with fidelity. Excellent. So, Stephen, we've already heard from you. We'll go back to everybody's interesting news in a second. Louise, how are you today? Very well, thank you very much. Nice to have Donna back on. Yes, it is. I think we kind of started to do our icebreaker already, or at least I, I would say that Donna has completed her icebreaker. Sometimes I <laughs> Stephen did, but I know what Stephen has to talk about. About. So why don't we just go icebreaker? Most interesting thing has happened in your life in the last week, professional or personal. Don, if you got another one, you can kick us off or you can say, pass, I already did that. I think it's going to be the topic that we have for the discussion today. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Come on. You've never passed an opportunity to, t- to say something. Come on. I, okay. My, the most exciting thing of the past week or so is my third vaccine. Yeah. Oh, third you shot. dog. You lucky dog. <laughs> uh, they wouldn't let me get mine. Dang it. So she can't for being too healthy. My icebreaker is um, probably more of a sad icebreaker. With the loss of my father-in-law to oh. cholangiocarcinoma, arguably potentially a uh, liver mass as well. So that happened over six weeks, which again is, although he was 90, uh, and it was the reason I missed the episode the other week, but no, we, we made good palliative care in the end, and he died comfortably at home with the family, so that was... It was a. It was what we want people to experience at the end of life, and it couldn't have gone any better. Your family was very lucky to have you there to help them with understanding of all of that, because I know oftentimes there's a lot of questions and people want answers, and answers aren't always available. And having somebody there that can kind of be the intermediary and explain that is often helpful. So I'm sure you were a huge positive for the whole family. The one thing I can say, I agree with you there. I think it makes it easier to discuss it and with medical professionals. A lot of families don't have that. And whereas I have insight into how the processes work and they're not joined up. So that would be a whole different episode on discharge planning and how you can have a respect, do not resuscitate me at home that doesn't go go into the community. So you've still got to get it all. That's a whole different episode of how we can, can join and get these systems way more suitable for people being discharged to reduce family stress at a time of high family stress. It is advantageous when you're within the profession to be able to put things together and coordinate them. But we were able to do that and we were able to get him home for the last week, which was difficult, but the best way. Louise, you said less than six weeks, but I recall the first time you raised it with me was, I think, a couple of weeks ago. And at that point, it didn't feel quite that immediate. Yeah, he just became unwell and went into hospital. And it was just the fact that he was 90. They did MRIs and CTs and found a shadow and they didn't biopsy or anything. So the presumption is cholangio, which is obviously a growing need, is Bardock cancer. And there's a a signatory campaign going on at the moment for raising awareness and early and diagnosis of these conditions but yes he just deteriorated and just naturally shut down and just wasn't eating and become but he wasn't in pain there was no discomfort or anything from that which is a blessing 
he was watching cricket the day before he decided to leave us. But no, we, as I say, we couldn't have had it any more controlled. But it was six weeks from diagnosis, less than six weeks from diagnosis to the terminal event. So again, it highlights the lateness of diagnosis due to lack of symptoms of anybody with liver disease or related conditions. That's something we're campaigning for. It's something we do here on the podcast very well. Donna and GLI, British Liver Trust are all absolutely campaigning for earlier diagnosis of these diseases. But I have to say he was 90. He would have been 91 at the end of this week. A lot of people do die younger, so we're still fighting for them. Yeah, interestingly, uh, Louise, I never shared this with you, but my father-in-law passed away from the exact same cancer when I was chief resident in 1999. And, you know, at that point, I didn't know anything about liver disease. I didn't know more than a recently graduated internist would know about liver cancer or cholangiocarcinoma. And just being there for the family and explaining what symptoms he was having and what we could or couldn't do about it was very helpful. But uh, to your point, he, he lasted about six weeks as well from the time of diagnosis. And he was generally healthy in his late 50s when, when this happened. So fast forward, what, 22 years and, and it's still happening. That's hard. Godspeed to him wherever his journey takes him. And if there are any organizations that the family is requesting donations for, please let me know after the podcast. Yes, we'll post it on the website. Thank you. We'll do. Stephen, go ahead. Well, I don't know if this is good news or bad news. So I, I mentioned to my podcast of tears, if that's a if that's a word. <laughs> Uh, I, I am officially an empty nester as of today. My uh, my daughter uh, moved in to college. Her last visit with her parents was yesterday. Her convocation at Southern Methodist University occurred at 5.30 in the afternoon, and she officially started class at 9 o'clock this morning. So I now have a junior at Texas A&M and a freshman at Southern Methodist University. And officially, after 21 years, it's back to just me and, and Renee at home. Home, although we do have two dogs, but I was commenting to my colleagues before we started the podcast that when I get home from work tonight, it'll be interesting to see how that goes. I'm hoping for the best, but uh, we'll, we'll see. It's it's great news in the sense that I feel like we packed the suitcase with all the equipment that our kids need to do to be successful. They have everything they need. Uh, and then it's also sad that, as Donna mentioned, the house will be very quiet and empty. I, I didn't meant I that was a plus. That was that was to encourage you to embrace it and all the opportunities and possibilities that having the house to yourself can involve. I don't know what that's like, so we'll, I'll have to rediscover. Well, so St- Stephen, by the way, that's a unanimous sentiment among those of us who've been empty nesters, who are empty nesters currently. I, I second what Don has to say. I said this to you last week on podcast, but not only. It was the longest 15 minutes of my life, and then we got on with it. Some people, it takes a little bit longer, but that's about kind of how it worked for me. All right. Well, I'll, I'll be happy to report in the coming weeks how, how the empty nesting is going. And we will be listening eagerly, and I'm sure the audience will as well. All right. So to move on to mine, we're at the Jersey Shore. As I say, I got my bike ride in, my 25K bike ride in already. I'll, my run is scheduled for this week. But my wife and I like to take what's about a three-mile walk along the southern edge of Cape May. And in past years, I'm giving myself away, you would see to your right a ton of sand and to the, your left the ocean. This year, as we started walking, what we found was that there was a large body of water to our right where the sand had previously been. And we didn't know what it was. Uh, Our first thought was, well, gee, with all the global warming and the melting of the oceans, maybe we were stuck on a sandbar and who knew what high tide would bring. But we did a little research and it turns out that the Nature Conservancy and a couple of other groups have created a nesting habitat for waterfowl who were having a hard time being displaced by changes in environment. So they basically created a protected lake up there. And it's pretty remarkable. My, My wife took a picture of what had to be hundreds of waterfowl just scattered on the sand around us as we were walking. And they tell you, you can walk. Walk, but that's all you can do. They don't want you to swim there. No dogs, no beach vehicles, but it's a great walk. And it's uh, it's great to know that people are looking out for this stuff because it gets a little bit dicier. One sense in which there's hope for our future. One more sense in which there's hope for our future. With that, let me turn to today's subject, which is, I think, a little more complicated even on the issue of hope for our future. It's been a big week for news. For, first of all, please remember, we're now nine days away from you. So it's been a big week for news on COVID, a big couple of weeks. 
And I think we want to spend a little bit of time. If you remember, this is a podcast that started to talk about the impact that COVID-19, the original pandemic, was having on fatty liver disease. And here we are, 90 episodes and not quite a year and a half later. And this is a week that that explodes in the news again for several different reasons. Number one, today is the day that the Pfizer vaccine received full approval in the U.S., That follows by a couple of days, the day that President Biden announced that the government would be supporting vaccinations for immunocompromised people. It also follows by not very long, a series of data coming out of many places, Israel being the best source. But we've also seen data from China, Portugal, UK, a whole bunch of places, specifically addressing the degree to which the vaccines become less effective over time, particularly in the presence of the Delta variant. At the same time, all that's going on, due to what some in the U.S. are calling the pandemic of the unvaccinated, our daily new infection rates have skyrocketed. And we're seeing again in parts of the country what we saw last year where you can't find an ICU or a hospital bed. So all this going on at once and all these things have, from different perspectives, have important implications for the fatty liver community. So what I think I'd like us to do is take a a think a little bit about what all this means. We know, as I say, that the seven-day rolling average in the U.S. had 142,000 cases yesterday, which had been only 20,000 cases maybe a month ago or six weeks ago. Huge increase. And and we, if you live in the States, are reading the stories about not being able to find it. There is not a single, well, for the last 10 days, reportedly, there's not been a single pediatric ICU bed in the Dallas area, or I believe in the Houston area. I can't speak to San Antonio, Stephen. You know, and, and one out of every 1,200 people in Florida right now has an active case of COVID. And you can't find hospital beds there either. So we've got all that going on. We've got, and we've got the studies reporting degradation of effective vaccine in the face of Delta variant over time. So what I wanted to do is I wanted each of us, from one perspective, to take a look at how the COVID 19 and Delta is touching our lives right now and what we foresee in the months ahead. First, I think I'd like to turn to Donna and talk about what it means from a patient perspective. We've been involved for, it seems forever now, but I guess technically just 18 months in staking out a very proactive position in terms of making sure or at least fighting for uh, prioritization of first just clear, direct information to people with autoimmune diseases and particularly liver transplant, liver cancer patients. But as we realized as COVID hit, how liver patients as a whole were in a high risk category and immunologically and, and, and otherwise. These past few weeks, we really feel vindicated. The first rounds of vaccine, we were seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth. You know, we were so low on the list. I I couldn't even count how far down we were in terms of accessing the first round of vaccines in, in the U.S. in particular and how that made liver patients feel transplant recipients feel, cancer patients feel that we were, we felt completely devalued. Like it did not matter whether we lived or died. It was important that that never happened again, that looking at the data coming out of, of China, of Italy, of Israel, out of France, out of, um, out of the UK and thank the UK so much for the research that was done. We thank French for the policy um, advancements. We thank Israel uh, for being so, so high performing so that we would have solid, solid arguments in addition to the the studies that were being done in the U.S. in terms of vaccine effectiveness, since, of course, transplant recipients, for example, weren't in the initial trials. And so to be able to get in a short, you know, it was a very exciting sort of late night Thursday before last when FDA did, followed very shortly by uh, the CDC Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices Decisions, and then the CDC approval of vaccines for several defined categories of immunocompromised people. And I recognize that there was sort of a collective howl from several NASH patients about, well, we weren't included. It's not us. Uh, Transplant's just obvious. And I said, well, it may be obvious. That doesn't mean we didn't have to fight for it. And we're still fighting for you. But one of the things that was part of our strategy was that it seemed just indefensible that transplant recipients, for example, or, or kidney patients on dialysis, people who are already identifiable and connected to a healthcare system and a provider, and, you know, in a very concrete way of being able to get a vaccination that, you know, were just not, those avenues were not used, were just ignored in the, in the first round. And so to be able to have a relatively small number of people whose risk was supported by the evidence that had been created in this time frame 
frame and who we could readily define a very clear way to provide them access to the vaccine in a way and in a time period that did not undermine the narrative, uh, the arguments and the efforts towards global vaccine equity, because we were in many cases in the same boat. We were folks who didn't get, you know, had no response. And so we were as if we hadn't taken anything at all for the most part. And so it wasn't the case of weighing into the politics of a booster for immunocompetent people or, or whole other things. It was just a, a really narrow population of, of people who were very vulnerable to COVID-19 in all of its current forms. And we're also, from a public health perspective, in our under-vaccinated states, just little variant incubators. So from a public health standpoint, there was a very clear evidence-based argument to make about about prioritizing access for transplant recipients, cancer patients, our GI friends on, on Remicade and other biologics, high-dose steroids, and very easily scientifically defined categories. But it took a lot of conversations. We've talked to multiple medical societies and CDC. Uh, we talked to multiple uh, members of the FDA leadership about the urgency that was needed for liver patients. This really is a great example of the triumph of liver advocates speaking. It wasn't just the kidney folks. It wasn't just kidney transplant. We're specifically looking for and using liver transplant data, liver cancer data, and that really hadn't been done before, we were told. And so we were really proud to to represent that and to make sure that that was put into place as quickly as possible. We'll have a new COVID update Q&A and glossary term and, and, and things like that so people can understand. And then the next round is making sure that, that we do realize the suppressant status of liver diseases for the most part of their own. And so there is access to. So the message is to, you know, to liver patients, to NASH patients who may not have found themselves included in this prioritized category that between now and the September 20th date for larger and certainly with today's news of full approval, which gives their physicians a lot of more flexibility to provide them a vaccine in office. You know, we're not leaving you behind. We're, you know, we're here for every, every liver patient, but to make sure that the most vulnerable amongst the most vulnerable were prioritized in a way that they hadn't been before is a real triumph. That does sound right. And congratulations. I remember when the first round of vaccines were available, I was struck by the idea that it was easier for me to get a vaccine than for you. And that seemed harshly unfair to me. Yes. Thank you. I was really glad that we could correct that. It's not as if, and, and we worked very, very hard as part of our advocacy to not create a jostling of people with different conditions or putting one age group against the other, but really working. And this is the first thing in our conversations with a lot of the medical society. What evidence do you have? What evidence do you need? How we can help you create it? Do you need more liver patients in certain study? High, you know, help us define high quality studies and put sign attention to them so that you can, we can have the data that we need to make sound arguments. So we really wanted to lead with the science. And there are larger conversations, of course, in the, in the regulatory conversation about the value of patient voice and how much weight it should be given. And so it was very important for us to have our advocacy be based on evidence, but also an urgency in those who are creating the evidence to do so and to make it widely available to match the speed of patient needs. It's one of the reasons why in part of this great fall refreshing and resetting for the Global Liver Institute that we are excited to add a patient insights and data center to help advance the development and inclusion of patient-generated health data and patient-defined research questions into the conversation, into policy and, and, and program making. So when you say patient insights and data center, that sounds like marketing research to me. Maybe it's because it's my background or maybe that's because what it is. What exactly will that center do? It can be some ethnographic research that often is done as part of market research. My first description would be all the information that I as a patient have of all the things that I'm doing that impact my health that I do outside of the doctor's office, outside of an EHR that isn't currently captured, whether that's you know symptoms or pain or other things that I'm taking or doing or exercise and, and what have you. We also think of it as there are lots of 
data that's being collected that, that hasn't been considered health data before, whether that's geolocation data or a or hundred different types of data that, that Google and Apple and others with whom we've had recent conversations are collecting about people that can be, that are being used for health. There's a great COVID mobility tracker that Google has, has stood up that's helped governments determine their COVID policies. There have been flu trackers from Twitter and, and just a, a lot of ways that information can be used that hasn't been applied to liver questions before. There are a lot of data in a lot of different silos of, or repositories and, and, and registries, rather than, whether claims data, EHR, research resident, resident uh, registries, and to be able to query across them to answer questions that patients have is really exciting. We're doing that with the European Society of Transplantation, for example, on their registry, top 10 questions that liver transplant recipients have and seeing how many can be answered with the data that they already collect in their in their registry. But really being able to create a fuller picture of the patient experience and the things that patients care about. And I'll give you I'll give you an example of things that patients may care about. When I went in for or was considering my knee replacements, I wanted to know how do liver transplant recipients do with knee replacements? I'm sure there are ways to get that data. For NASH patients, we with so many concurrent conditions going on, you need so much more knowledge about what they're eating, how they're moving, what services that they are are using and putting together, how they're feeling about it, how their pain, how their caregivers feeling about it. Are they working? Are they not? There are PROs and things that are in trials. There's a collection of, of things, but to put it under a banner and to have it driven by questions that patients have, I think is an exciting opportunity. Uh, Louise, Stephen, you have questions for Don or, or thoughts on the whole subject? I mean, I, I think it's apropos that just, just recently, this this month actually, Raj Reddy published a review article in Journal of Viral Hepatitis entitled COVID-19 in the Liver, Lessons Learned from the East and the West a Year Later. And he speaks exactly along the same lines that Donna is speaking to. In fact, his concluding statement was patients with chronic liver disease, particularly cirrhosis and liver transplant recipients, are vulnerable to severe COVID-19 over the past year several unique considerations have been highlighted across the spectrum of hepatobiliary diseases. Vaccination is strongly recommended for those with chronic liver disease and liver transplant recipients. And in fact, in his article, he goes on to say that a booster vaccination, a third dose for immunocompromised patients is suggested. And and how apropos that, in fact, the guidance came out just to that this month. And, and uh, those immunocompromised patients are now eligible for a third dose. It speaks on a broad front to many of the, the things that Donna's been speaking about and advocating for. It's the result of lots of different groups coming together and he's speaking with a unified voice. Many of you know Raj Reddy. He, he's been a, a transplant hepatologist and an advocate for liver transplant patients for at least a couple decades. And what a great document to have written by such a thought leader in the field. I just am, am so glad that that has come out and, and that those patients are able to be given that additional booster vaccine. So those are my initial thoughts. I'm really grateful for the networks that were set up by CVS and Walgreens and, and bringing vaccines into, into communities because I, it was less than you know 24 hours from seeing my test results, seeing that big fat zero <laughs> um, response, talking to my doctor, signing up at CVS and getting a vaccine. It, it made it very seamless. That issue of test results, though, I, I do want to push the medical community on. I know that they are pushing back on patients getting tested for their, you know, own personal sort of antibodies and vaccine effectiveness. And while I understand that there are multiple parts of the immune system, I would like the medical community to come to a consensus quickly in terms of a test or just let all of us take the lab core semi-quantitative antibody tests like we have in the Hopkins study. Because otherwise, outside of those who, like me, who are on, in clear categories, who are taking drugs that have been studied and have a clear immunosuppressive effect, how do you give uh, information to an ASH patient or a cirrhosis patient, for example, on if they need a booster, how soon, when, is it waning? Is it waning for them? How are we going to do that if not to test? And I also feel sorry for the doctors who are, you know, if people are being told, well, ask your doctor, what's your doctor supposed to be making, having that conversation with you about? Is he just supposed to like wave his hand at you and be like, you look like a non-responder. I don't know what a doctor is supposed to use as a 
basis for that conversation unless we start having a test that gives people's more personalized response. Donna, can you expand on that a moment? Were you saying that you had your immunity to COVID-19 tested after your two vaccinations mm-hmm. and were found to have no antibody titers remaining? Yeah. No, I, yeah. My, I had no, I had no response to the vaccine to the first two doses. Do you know if you had initial response and then it waned over time? No, or that- I had nothing. I had nothing. I had zero before my first dose, zero after my first dose, zero after my second dose. And then I had a response after my third dose. And did you change vaccination manufacturers or did, did you use? Okay. I did. Based on the data and, and on transplant recipients. Yes. Got you. Okay. So just like we know that there are varied responses to Delta variant and all variants to some of the different vaccinations that are out there, the response among at least the immunocompromised could be widely varied as well. And I don't think that's a message that's clearly delivered. I mean, heck, we're still at the KISS principle, right, Donna? Keep it simple, stupid, just go get vaccinated. We, we just want you to line up and, and and put your arm out. But much like we're learning with hepatitis B, for instance, we need to dive into it maybe a little bit more, in particular a high-risk patient. We need to be doing actual testing after we vaccinate to see if it actually has allowed the body to build up am- antibodies. Because otherwise, we're still at ground zero, right? That I don't think is a message that's getting out there. I don't, Louise, I don't know if that's uh, in the UK, if that's getting out there, but it's certainly in the circles I run in in Texas is not something that that, that we're talking about much. And and maybe that's apropos to our cirrhotics as well and those with significant NAFL. I am reminded of, of another recent paper that is a meta-analysis of seven studies with 2,041 COVID-19 patients where it was clearly shown that, uh, that fatty liver disease increased the risk of severe COVID. Now, we've known that, but here's a meta-analysis that actually put the risk at 80% increased threshold over a non-fatty liver patients. So I think your point is one that we need to drive home. And that is, it's not only about getting a vaccine, it's about ensuring that the vaccine did what it was supposed to do. Right. And I and I have to admit, I delayed by a little while getting the effectiveness, you know, test after the second one because I didn't want my heart broken because I wanted to go out. I wanted to go to bed. I was like, I wanted to believe that it had worked, that it was effective. But I I saw the data and I knew patients who'd gone before me earlier in the study. And I I knew the chances were very low given everything that I'm taking because I'm having an underlying autoimmune disease. I'm still, I'm taking relatively high doses of my immunosuppressants for my transplant. I'm also on biologics for my Crohn's disease. And so the chance that my little immune system under the the weight of all of that, that I was going to be somehow be in the high responders group was low. And I didn't want to face that just as a human being. I didn't want to face that, but I I wanted the information more. And so I did put on my big girl pants and I went and got the test and it said zero. But then my doctors and I could make real decisions. I wasn't wandering around in a delusion that I was protected and getting on planes or going out or becoming loose in my precautions and then getting COVID. I knew what I was dealing with. And so the idea that patients aren't needing information to make decisions today about what they do, where they go, how they do it is something I need us all to to get over. And that's the urgency with which we're hoping this evidence is generated and that we're working to make sure that it gets to policymakers fast enough. And this one little pushback that's in the CDC guidelines and that the medical society statements keep making about don't get tested, don't have any effectiveness testing is the next thing that I'm going to be challenging, just FYI, for anybody who wants to know what's next up on my hit list, that's that's next on my on my hit list. And then after that is making sure that people are aware of monoclonal antibodies, but not using them as a get out of jail free card for not taking the vaccine. I'll just get the antibodies, just hook me up to the antibodies and I'll be fine. It's not for that. But people do need to know that it is available and free in as much as the government has purchased a lot of it. So taxpayers have paid for it and it is available to people, but we should keep it for the vulnerable who 
are vaccinated but have, you know, breakthroughs or otherwise unable to get vaccinated, not for people who just start believing in science at the moment that they come down with severe COVID. Why don't we shift to the UK a little bit and what's going on there? And then Stephen talking a little bit about what all this means for clinical trials. And then I'll come back and talk a little more about the US from a different perspective. Louise, floor is yours. Just leading on from what Donna was saying, which is absolutely great work, is it's about the uptake within those clinical groups as well um, that's going to be really important. Now, our latest figures here show that we've got about 87.7% of the population vaccinated for first doses. Now, that slightly fell from last week because what they've now done is combine the age groups and lower the age group to the 16 and over. So therefore, we've got 87.7% of the population vaccinated and over 65% now having second doses. We've done really well. The data out of Israel is slightly concerning that's showing breakthrough, but it's breakthrough in the older categories with really large comorbid conditions and really quite unwell, which I suppose is to be expected. I think if we look at the situation that we're currently seeing here, when I last look at the data that was published on Thursday, I think the most latest data is that we've got 6,444 patients in hospital, 928 of those are on ventilators. Now, the last summary that I got from Bart's Health that we were discussing within our teams was that 100% of all of those COVID cases in ITU were unvaccinated. The strength in the vaccination that we're seeing is very good. We're fairly stable at around about 27 to 35, 32,000 cases a day. Our hospital rate of 6,400, 6,000 is fairly static. So we're a nation who has come out with a, a large rollout of vaccination has been readily accepted throughout the country. We're now into more of the vaccine hesitancy populations, and I certainly have more conversations with the vaccine centre when I do some of that. But we're not overly seeing, to the best of my knowledge, and I'm not an immunologist, I'm not currently working in an acute setting, is that we're not seeing massive breakthrough. And there's a big debate here at the moment that you may or may not be aware of as to whether we go ahead with booster programme, whether or not we should be waiting to see whether there is a group that need the booster population. Donna's grouping of immunocompromised are already acknowledged to be one of those groups that are going to probably need the vaccine boosters for exactly the reasons that she's demonstrated and detailed here. We're also now preparing for the flu vaccination season to be able to vaccinate both flu and a booster if we needed to. As part of certainly my preparation for that, we're doing the flu vaccine courses. It would be interesting to know what the uptake with COVID has been within the liver population and those with liver disease. Does that do you know that within the US, Donna or Stephen, as to what the overall uptake for COVID's been within um, the liver disease population? Because you fought very hard to give people access and to really promote that. So do you know at all? It's been high. And the first round was just anecdotal evidence from a lot of Facebook communities, which is sort of a, a, a biased, engaged group. There were a recurring set of themes about why people might have been reluctant. First, it was timing early on. On. We saw that overcome as more transplant recipients got the vaccine and the mild side effects and the transient nature of the side effects reassured a lot of people. I think this full authorization today may not affect a large number of people who have vaccine hesitancies or whatever, but for our folks who are following the science, there's a significant section that this will make a difference to. The concerns were for people who already have a lot of immunological mischief or complexity going on and to add something else to it. They just wanted to get more information from their doctors and we're waiting for clarity of information from, from their medical societies where they're that now exists. There were just there were just a few holdouts, more of pregnant women and folks on on that that everybody understands why they'd be skeptical, particularly since there was no they were not in the trials as well. So overall, I would say the liver population more than the general population is very pro vaccine, and for the transplant recipients, it's it's more about protecting the gift. And the conversations that we heard throughout the community were you have to get vaccinated not for yourself, but to honor the gift that you've been given? The reason I'm particularly asking that question is when I've been doing the flu data and the stuff that we've got to, that chronic liver disease patients are a high-risk group for the flu vaccine and recommended for flu. Yet the uptake in the UK for 2021 was only 37% of those of the liver population took the 
flu vaccine. But when I was looking at the figures, the data that they produced between the clinical risk groups, September 2010 to May 2011, showed that chronic liver disease made up 9% of the fatal flu cases, but their mortality rate per 100,000 was 15.8. And that was in comparison, the next largest, the immunosuppression group was 20. But after that, it was neurological conditions at 14.7. So the liver disease population was a massive population at risk with age adjusted relative risk of 42.2. It was the highest outside of the immunosuppressed community. So it would be great to see the liver community. We're, we're forecasting this season a worst flu season because of the lack of immunity last year. So getting not only COVID, but the flu vaccine into our patient population is going to be vital. Yeah, we, we, we need to talk about that and we need to put that in messaging and bundle it. I have to admit, I sort of forgot about it. And, and it wasn't until I was in CVS as I always am every every third day at least, and saw the flu shot line. I was like, flu? Never had thought about the flu. Okay. and But I have some questions about timing the flu shot with COVID shot, and I'm sure other people do. So I'd like to you know explore that and have people talk about that and give people some clear information about how that works. Okay. Well, I'm going to be controversial. <laughs> Here's the priest. You, you do that, and then I'll do that, too. Go ahead. I'm going to be controversial. So, again, I know we're science-driven. We're data-driven. I don't have that caveat right up front, but I have anecdote. And for doctors, we may not change our practice based on one double-blind randomized placebo-controlled trial in the NEJM, but we will based on one anecdotal experience. So, here's my anecdote. How many people actually knew a person that had flu last year? I don't know if that's right. And, and let's take it one further step. My brother is an ER physician in Jackson, Mississippi. I mentioned that on this podcast several times. He hasn't seen a single case of the flu in 18 months. Mm -hmm. It's because we actually do this magical thing called hand washing and we wear masks, something the Asian community did long before COVID was ever a problem. In fact, I remember flying to Japan and Singapore and coming home and all these people had masks on. I'm like, what, what are you what are you doing? I mean, you have bad breath. What? What's the issue? And it literally was that they had the foresight to know that that's how a lot of these diseases are spread or through aerosolized spread. So at the end of the day, I, I personally, I think we're going to have another mild year of the flu and COVID will be the thing that we should worry the most about. That's just a side note. But it, it doesn't mean I'm, I don't advocate flu vaccine at all. I just, I don't think that personally flu is going to be that big of a deal again this year. Do you really? I'm going to be really controversial now and say you've got your biggest COVID outbreaks in states where nobody wears masks. They're not wearing masks. So why <clears throat> is that going to stop the flu? I'm not so sure it's not that they're not wearing masks. I think it's because they're not vaccinated. So they're not going to take the flu vaccine and they're not going to wear masks. Sometimes those goes hand in hand. Although I will tell you, Texas is pretty on, on the pretty, the, we're on the far right, correct? I mean, we're, we, we do things our own way and we're not quite as bad as Florida, but we're pretty far up there. That's your new state motto. We're not as bad as Florida. <laughs> <laughs> we're not we're not as bad as Florida. Uh, we're number 49. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, I think for sure the the issue is the Delta variant. And and while the flu is always going to be around, I I just think we're in for another year of a, a mild flu season. Louise, you're going to get to January and prove me wrong. I know you are, but that's at least my initial you heard it here first. So Stephen, I would love to prove I would love for us to prove you wrong, but I think I'm on Louise's side on this. No, you would love to prove me right. Not wrong. Yeah, that's right. I'd love to prove you right. It's exactly right. I would like to have a mild flu season. That's exactly right. I think we all would. But we have turned masking and all that look at state of Tennessee for a while there wanted to outlaw uh, talking about children's vaccines to go back into school. It, it's become, and I think that the challenge is that, that parts of this country are, are interested in the science of it and parts of this country have really gotten far away from that. Roger, here, here's an interesting thought. My son, who is will turn 21 years old in 10 days and is already kind of prepping for the, the time he can show his ID card and actually get a beverage, adult beverage, legally, told me today, he said, Dad, the vaccine has finally been approved. And I said, 
son, the vaccine has been conditionally approved for quite some time. And he said, yeah, but that's why nobody's gotten it, because it wasn't fully approved. And I said, son, that's the way drug development is in the country. Just look at NASH. We get a drug approved. It's conditionally approved. Until we show how it changes how a patient feels, functions, or survives, it's not fully approved. There, There is a misconception that gets thrown around on social media, and these influencers spread this through TikTok and other social media platforms that don't trust the drug. It's only conditionally approved. Don't trust the vaccine. It's only conditionally approved. It hasn't been tested in enough people yet. And so really, we had a a very heart to heart discussion about how the FDA works today and how the drug is no different today than it was yesterday. Nothing magical happened today that made it suddenly okay to take the drug or the vaccine versus yesterday. But uh, I'm hoping that with the news that came out today, that that will encourage another certain percentage, who knows how many percentage points, will actually go get their vaccine because now officially the vaccine must work. Whereas yesterday it was still under investigation. It had an emergency use authorization and now it's been sprinkled with the full array of regulatory science dust. Hey, you know, you you can't talk around your whole life's work of like doing research and, and, and studies that we find out things as we test them in more people and as we fully analyze the data. So, gosh, you sound like me. You sound like a patient. You sound like what I told Dennis 15 years ago when we first got married. Things did not become the truth when they were published in a peer-reviewed study. They were the truth. They were simply revealed to be so. So, but the difference between an emergency use authorization, and I know the reams and reams of data that some, you know, really hardworking FDA staff went through to look for to give even more confidence to the general public. I do hope that this full authorization both convinces more people to take it or at least takes away an excuse of some folks to take it or to mandate it and certainly gives more freedom for people to prescribe it and will increase access. So it is a really important day. I think the distinction between take it and mandate it is pretty pivotal. They were showing in surveys two, three months ago that people who were violently opposed to the vaccine, you couldn't give them a single argument that would make them support it. They said the only way they would take it is if they were forced to. And to to the degree that organizations were holding up on mandating until full approval, I think that will turn out to be a big deal. Stephen, that will dwarf the few percentage points that you're talking about. Although I think there will be people like your son who are, who are waiting for that, because depending on where you get your media from, there are people who have made a big fuss out of that. On the other hand, 10 o'clock hour at Fox last week, they were talking about the value of ivermectin. So silly season isn't going to end. No, it, it's not going to end. And listen, every percentage point counts, right? No percentage point left behind. We, we'll take whatever we can get. In the U.S., one percentage point is who knows how many people that is. It's quite a big number. I think there are 93 million who are still still unvaccinated, who are eligible, but still unvaccinated. And so to get 900,000 people or something, maybe huge. It's a good thing. Not, yeah. So I sent you guys this. There's a Twitter feed I saw today from someone in County Durham in the UK mm-hmm. saying, hey, we've got to get our numbers up there too low. The numbers that they were talking about, according to government UK, were 75.3% vaxxed. And that was too low. In the States, right? That's heroic. That is. It's certainly not Alabama or Mississippi. And here's the thing. Until we get to, well, I guess we're going to get herd immunity one way or another, or community immunity one way or, or the other. There. You know, the way that it's being done, though, causes hundreds of thousands of unnecessary deaths. But if that's how people choose to have it, if that's the freedom that we want to have it, the freedom to die unnecessarily because you will not take a vaccine or a mask as an adult, that is sad but true. The dis- the injustice that we're doing to our children, however, is unforgivable. The one thing I'm going to put into the mix of this is the world has done a very good job, uh, or certain nations have done a very good job at scaremongering on AstraZeneca. But it looks like the vector vaccines may well be more protective against the Delta variant in some of the data that's coming out and the reduction in Pfizer and Moderna. Um, So we haven't decided what our booster doses are going to be, but you've got countries like Australia with very few infections per 100,000, with the troops on the streets locking down for one case whole cities, the same as New Zealand. And then we have the UK. We're out of lockdown now. A lot of people are respecting masks. A lot of people are doing that. We've got fairly stable cases. Yes, we've got 6,000 people static in hospital at the 
the moment is very stable with AstraZeneca. And we're seeing a lot of people from around the world coming to get second vaccine programs, which we're not doing in the UK, from Sputnik, from China, from thing because they want the doses or they want another vaccine program as part of that. I was going to mention that the Financial Times had a piece today taking a look at two countries that have been aggressive in vaccinating using single vax, Pfizer in Israel and AstraZeneca in UK, and that all the projected curves say that at about four months, the lines will cross and AZ, as y'all would call it, will wind up being more protective more than four months out than Pfizer will, which is, I think, really an important point in the context of boosters and everything else. And, and also, by the way, that good science isn't made with rush to judgment. I mean, what happened to AZ happened because of some things that happened in the first couple of weeks in cases that didn't happen as prevalently with the uh, RNA vaccines. But that's not how good science gets done. And that, that may be one of the things that we're learning now. I think that I would be remiss if we didn't leap off from that point and ensure that we can't be safe here in the United States or in any you know, or in the UK or Australia, if the world isn't safe, if, if Africa and South America, India don't have a fully fleshed out and reality-based vaccine strategy and we participate in it. I, when I look at the expiration of, you know, a vaccine's various places, it, it, it seems to me that the untapped manufacturing capacity, you know, in India, for example, to have more doses produced in country or close closer than certainly New Jersey or Michigan or someplace where the shipping isn't as much of an issue. And then with our donations, but then also really focusing on those last mile. Is there someone to take it from the airport where it's dropped into a network of, of villages at the right temperature with nurses or, or community health? workers who know how to administer vaccines and have the trust of their communities, you know, do we, have we done enough to ensure that any country both receives vaccines from a source as close as possible, but is able to pull them all the way through that last mile to the people who need them? Yeah, Donna, but that's a whole different challenge. If you go back 15, 20 years, this is, ivermectin never comes up in this podcast. It's about to do that twice in two very different contexts. Merck learned 25 years ago, I guess it is now, that they could cure African river blindness with ivermectin. So they gave away the drug. And they then learned that the real expense was creating distribution networks in sub-Saharan Africa to get it to people. Well, that's why I mention it, because it's not just enough about how many millions of doses that the U.S. should be shipping somewhere, which commitments I, I absolutely do believe in. But I, I believe those other two factors, increasing in-country manufacturing capabilities, which benefits long-term economic health for that country, as well as physical health, storing up their medical systems and that health network. And I think for, as we've been talking about doing NASH education and putting liver health hubs in different countries based on the relationships that we've developed through International NASH Day, you know, this ability to hear COVID vaccination with other aspects of, of, of liver health I, it has accelerated both conversations, our, our conversation of being able to deliver NASH and other liver health in country and in the field and, and COVID vaccination as well. So Donna, I would love to come back to that issue, maybe in whatever month we choose to do an episode on AAA, that'll be part of the AAA episode. But right now we've taken a bunch of time. The one other issue I want to get to before we ring out today, this podcast started looking at a very specific question, which is COVID-19 and clinical trials. So Stephen, I guess the question is, have the adaptations that the system made be adequate to deal with what Delta and possibly subsequent variants are throwing at us? Or are we seeing an emergence of a new set of challenges? challenges around that? And if so, uh, how do we deal with that going forward? Yeah, you know, I think we, we, we've gotten pretty facile at, at working around COVID relative to clinical trials. It's not to say we don't still have issues. I think the biggest issue really is in getting patients to come forward for screening and doing all the study-related procedures that are required. Just today, for instance, we had a patient that was very skeptical about moving forward with his MRI and his liver biopsy because of the Delta variant surge despite having been vaccinated. So it's still an issue, but we've been able to manage through that issue, albeit at a, at a slightly slower pace. Our screening numbers are still down from pre-COVID and our randomization numbers are down from pre-COVID, but shops are able to remain operational and open, generally speaking, and NASH trials are being able to be accomplished, albeit still at a slightly slower pace. What has 
paradoxically, I think one of the benefits of this pandemic has been working with sponsors and CROs to find ways, unique ways, novel ways to to bring healthcare delivery to the home in the form of portable phlebotomy, drug delivery, even telehealth visits over over the phone relative to safety checks, adverse event assessments, etc. So we are using this pandemic or or as a result of the pandemic, we're making great strides in how we do clinical trials and how we deliver healthcare that I think will be far reaching well beyond the resolution of this pandemic. So in a way it is spearheaded, it is galvanized, use the whatever word you want to use to basically fast forward our development, if you will, of healthcare delivery to patients to make it easier for them to get what they need and to get it in a safe and effective way. So I, I'm excited about where we're headed, and I would say that we're still able to do what we need to do, albeit at a slightly slower pace. I think advances certainly in blood-based or serum-based screening for NASH really helps think through what it would really take to do a fully decentralized or, or home trial in NASH. And as we take the time to to look at each element of a trial in NASH and, and figure out, is it essential to get us the valuable data in a way that's that's feasible for the patient and the physician? This has brought on some really great new opportunities, accelerated a lot of technology that patients have wanted to have integrated into the research setting for a while. And it is really exciting. And as we think about how we can scale up NASH research and meet sort of my personal ambition to fill up every NASH trial, I think it really will have to be this decentralized or at least a hybrid trial model so that it, it you know, more patients can participate. The other thing that, that I'll say parenthetically is one of the organizations that we've found and have been able to work very closely with is one called the Healthy Truckers Association. I didn't know that organization existed, but ever since we've been working with them and I'm driving up and down Interstate 35 between San Antonio and Dallas, I'm struck by the sheer numbers of trucks that are on the road. All it takes is one car wreck and you see the huge pile up on three lanes on the interstate and you can't see 10 feet in front of you without hitting a semi. I mean, they're everywhere. And the nice thing about developing applications for clinical trials that can be portable and delivered to the patient is that we're able to access organizations such as the Healthy Truckers Association to really deliver healthcare in a portable setting. Whether you're in Washington, D.C. today or Omaha, Nebraska tomorrow, tomorrow or LA in three days uh, doesn't mean you can't have your appointment. And, and I think that's that's some of the advances that, that we're making. And, and this pandemic has supercharged those developments. So that's great. I'm going to ask you a couple of rather specific questions that we were asking at the beginning of the pandemic 18 months ago when we started this podcast, things people wanted to know, right? The question then was, how much will things slow down? And the answer was a lot. And we had a couple of estimates of what that meant. Is this pandemic, are we well enough equipped that we will stay at the same rate we are now, albeit a slower rate than it used to be two years ago? Or will the effect of Delta and subsequent variants be maybe to slow things down a little more, not derail them, but slow them further? Would you guess? In NASH studies? Yeah. No, we'll be back. We'll, we'll be back faster. We'll be, we'll be, as soon as we can get past this pandemic, uh, if, if that's such a thing, the tools, the equipment, the technology that is being generated during this pandemic time will allow us to take huge strides forward in streamlining the process and making healthcare delivery more efficient and effective and safe for patients. I believe and that's be, absolutely as, right. Totally agree. And there's a pent up demand for research that we've certainly helped create and an importance and some resources and tools about what it's like to participate in a national clinical trial and how important that is and, and integrating that into the messaging and the workflow for primary care and other, other physicians. And so we're using this time wisely, all of us across the research enterprise, advocacy included, and we will be really in a great place to to jumpstart research when it's a little safer, even more than now. Excellent. So let me be a pain in the neck and do the devil's advocate version of the question one more time, and then we're good. I understand the aftermath and all the benefits of that. But Stephen, if Delta got us up to a couple hundred thousand cases a day in the U.S., big jump over even where we are now. During the period we were managing that 
wave, would it affect the timing of trials or are you guys solid enough now that the timing will hold where it is and then improve later, do you think? I think any more surge in, in the Delta variant we will we'll have a, a big impact on our enrollment timelines. They've been mitigated slightly, but I still think we're able to predict enrollment completion for many studies based on current screening and randomization paradigms. Mm-hmm. If that worsens to any significant degree, we're going to see that impact clinical trials research. Right now, it's very calculated we know what we're dealing with. We know we know what to expect. But but again, I think that's a, still a, fl- a bit of a fluid situation. And I understand the point that you made, which I don't think people are thinking about, no, certainly in financial community, which is if you get this in the rearview mirror, things will go faster. And I, I, because, yes, that's correct. Absolutely. So I think both those points are important. The fluidity now has an upside and a downside both, which I think is important to note. All right. With that, anybody have any other questions or we should, we're, we're, this has been a, an excellent and long session in part because of the 20 minutes of kibitzing up front in part because of the topic. Um, should we go to final question? Anybody have we just don't want to let Donna go. Okay. And so we've drug it out a little bit longer than normal. <laughs> and we're going to see if we can make it last another hour because we just don't, we, we're not good at saying goodbye. Stephen, she's on the hook to come back once a month unless we scare well, her off. So um... you, you, you haven't scared me, um, but you also haven't made me burn my, my roast chicken. <laughs> Did we have her a hello? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So final question. What should our listeners take away from this conversation about the part of the pandemic that touches you? Don, the patients, Louise, kind of what we're seeing in the UK, Stephen, treatment or clinical trial, take your pick. Go ahead. Yeah. So I would say that the last message is that NASH patients are more vulnerable to risk of COVID, you know, severe effects of COVID and need to be prioritized for vaccination and need to really understand uh, their individualized response. And so we're working on that. I, I think it will lead to additional research in the immunocompromising effect of having a liver disease and all, which was something not at all on anybody's radar screen before this, I think. Mm-hmm. Going just fully agree with Donna on all those points. And I think also using science to help protect you against all illnesses. Liver patients are susceptible at, at a greater risk to all of these viral illnesses. We're discovering more liver patients throughout the pandemic because more liver patients are being affected. So again, the early diagnosis of people with liver disease undiagnosed fatty liver disease, undiagnosed NASH needs to continue a pace that Donna on that lead. If you can be protected for COVID, be vaccinated, but also for the flu vaccine as well. Even if we don't get a, a bad flu season, you've protected yourself as much as you can possibly. And we, and we are vaccinating relatives of those who are immunocompromised, again, to protect those who are immunocompromised here. And they're given a fast timeline to do that. So keep going. Well, I'm just going to end with, with a quote. If the vaccine isn't given, Life may not be worth living. Ooh, that's a great Ooh. setup for a Luke Bryan concert. <laughs> Hi, <Jason. laughs> Ooh. I was trying to find something like, if the glove doesn't fit, you must have quit. Yeah, you know, I, think, yeah I think you did. It. No, no, I think, I think you you're, you're perfect. Donna, I think we're talking bumper sticker here from GLO. Donna, I'm, I'm, making a, I'm making a T-shirt, you know, right okay. now. All right. So here, here's mine. All right. People who would like to be educated about all the complexities of science and think about their own health and the health of those they love in that context. This has been a fantastic experience, not the podcast, but the entire event with a lot of cost attached to it. The challenge, I think, in the States and to a lesser degree in other countries is going to be whether we can cut through clutter surrounding the politicization of science. I'd like to think that that will happen over time, but it's going to be a challenge. And one, frankly, we've kind of got to get right eventually, or else we're going to lose a lot more people and we're going to lose them in in, in ways that we, we would rather not. So on that not particularly upbeat note, let me thank Donna for coming back and staying half hour past expected and showing up early so we could give it in advance. And Louise and Stephen as well. We will be back next week. Uh, topic to be determined. I think I know what we're going to talk about, but I'm not 100% sure yet. So I'm going to say thanks and let you guys go. And I'll come back a little bit later and do the business uh, business portion and wrap it up. Louise, Donna, Stephen, thank you so much for everything. See you all later. Thank, thank you. Guys. I want to let you in on a small secret. Sometimes I don't record this until a few days after the live episode itself. Today's an example of that. I'm back from the shore now, trying to maintain the peaceful vibe of the Cape May waves for as long as possible. Response to the last three weeks has been amazing. 
Before the past month, all our best performing episodes were either conferences, news events, sponsored sessions, or some combination of the three. However, this last month has changed all that. The Cirrhosis episode's total weekly download count is our second best ever. Total downloads for the last two weeks, the last three weeks, and the last four weeks all set podcast records. I can't wait to see what response to this episode looks like. If you're listening to this, you're a big part of our success by becoming a new listener, staying a faithful listener, telling your friends and co-workers to listen, or just spreading positive karma. Whichever of those apply to you, thanks. This week's pod status news. Not only has listenership hit new highs, but we appeared on two more pod status lists for the first time, both in the same country. Late last week, we debuted as number four on the South Korean Medical Podcast Top 250 list and, more exciting, number 33 on the much tougher health and fitness list, all the while maintaining our positions in the other global markets where we do well. To our Korean friends, mayu kamsa nida, or thank you so much, and apologies for flaws in pronunciation. Questionnaires coming in a few days, if they aren't available already. Our questionnaires are in final edit. We plan to post toward the end of the week or right after the Labor Day weekend. Keep your eyes peeled. And with that, I want to thank the band, Stephen, Louise, and Donna, for bringing their A-games and A-plus senses of humor to this week's podcast. Riverside FM for recording, Buzzsprout for distribution, our excellent new editing app, Despatch, that makes my life easier, and, of course, to the surfing crew, Mike, Eric, Polly. We will post the next episode on Wednesday, September 8th. Throughout the week, we are recording a summer wrap-up as a series of interviews. It should be fun. So, until then, stay safe, surf on, see you on the podcast. Bye-bye now. Have any questions for the surfers? You can send them to surfingnash.com, and we will answer on the podcast or the website. <laughs>